Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. We have two guests today, a couple of giants in the recording business who were just honored with their inductions into the NAM Tech Hall of Fame, Dave Pensato and Herb Trawick. Now, Dave Pensato has mixed thousands of records, but I'll name just a few of the artists he's worked with to give you a sense of how much history he's created and how valuable his ears are still. How about Elton John, Michael Jackson, Lionel Richie, Brian McKnight, Tony Braxton, Janet Jackson, Boys to Men, Maroon 5, Jill Scott, Macy Gray, Jermaine Dupree, Seal, Mary J. Blige, Pink, Shakira, Beyonce, Wiz Khalifa, Justin Timberlake, Christina Aguilera, Ice Cube, and T-Pain, just to name a few. Herb Trawick came from the business side of the business, having secured record deals for artists like Brian McKnight, Robin Thicke, and Tyrese Gibson. He's worked with labels like Capitol, Interscope, Island, Mercury, Def Jam, all the way back to working A&R for Solar Records, the imprint that gave L.A. and Babyface their first hit with The Whispers. It was also the label to which our dear friends and frequent guests, Rich Uggen and Dave Agent, were signed with their band Collage. Not sure if Herb had anything to do with that, but the small world of Solar Records gave us a lot, and Herb was definitely there. Together, the two of them have built Pensado's Place, a show that has been a beacon for those in the inside of the recording business for coming up on 10 years now. You can watch a show at pensadosplace.tv where their guests have been the best of the absolute best in recording and mixing. Folks like Anderson Pack, Al Schmidt, Keith Urban, Mark Needham, Butch Vig, Tim Pierce, and Kenny Aronoff. If you have any interest in producing, engineering, mixing, mastering, or the recording business, it's the place to go to get way inside with your favorites. Now, we want to thank NAM, the National Association of Music Merchants, and the Technical Excellence and Creativity Awards for bringing us all together every year and for putting us together with Dave and Herb. And, of course, we had last year's Hall of Fame inductee Leslie Ann Jones on the show, along with Tech Awards musical director and arranger, respectively, our friends Larry Batiste and Clay Tovin Richardson. So if you're in the business, make sure you join NAM. And make sure you go to the Tech Awards. It's truly where the music creators community gets together. And about the Break It Down show, as always, please tell your friends about it, pass the link around, and reach back to us, John or Pete, at breakitdownshow.com to get either one of us. And we definitely want to hear from you, especially if you're from parts far afield. Our listeners in Greece, Macedonia, Luxembourg, and especially Guam, my motherland, hit us up. Also, support SaveTheBrave.org. You can go read about them at SaveTheBrave.org, of course. You guys know the drill. They deserve your support. They certainly get ours. So, Pete did this episode with Dave and Herb, and I promise I'll be in on the next one because I'm a huge fan of these guys, and I got a lot of questions for them, too. But you're going to love where they go with Pete. So, without further ado, here are our guests, Herb Trawick and Dave Pensato. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Dave Pensato. And this is Herb Trawick, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. Hey, so we have a real treat here. We have a couple of Hall of Famers on the show. Now, when we're talking, recording this, they haven't quite yet been inducted by Marine Droney from the Grammys, but um, they will be by the time you hear this. They are getting inducted into the Tech Awards, the NAM Tech Awards Hall of Fame. And this is pretty cool because these guys have... Well, look, they have an amazing podcast. First of all, you guys should go check out Pensado's Place. And you can go to you can go to pensadosplace.tv and you can get over to YouTube as well and, and see the, uh, the the podcast if you're really into, I guess, what, like, fellas, like the production side of things and getting into compression and, and different equipment, which is sort of why we're ultimately here. All right. Uh, so let's let's cover some background so everybody can sort of understand what you guys do dave you're, you're more the technical guy and then herb you're more of um more of the like the like the, the ear the nose to the to the great music is, is that fair to say or how would you guys characterize your relationship well ahead, i would dave. say that 
that, that Herb and I, we, we don't have like clear cut boundaries in terms of things. Herb, Herb's a little bit technical and I'm a little bit not technical. Uh, I try to just be myself and, and talk mostly what I know about, which is engineering and, and, and music. And Herb, describe yourself. I think that the context of the show from the inception of the show to now almost 500 episodes later and 10 years plus has always been a 360 view of audio. And so that obviously includes a very important technical component, but because of where both of us come from, you also have to deal with creativity and humanity and insight and ears and business affairs and, things that happen and affect creative people. So we've always tried to make sure we're approaching the whole thing because everybody approaches the technical side. But what makes Butch Vig Butch Vig is not the same thing that makes CLA CLA is not the same thing that makes Mix by Ali Mix by Ali. Those are internal things. And we try to get to those insights, test those things. So I kind of have that side, and we put those two things together, and it's been pretty successful for us. It's not often that two middle-aged Hall of Famers have a powerful, uh, have powerfully successful YouTube show, but you guys managed to pull it off. Let's let's look a little bit about the pedigree of where you guys come from, so we can get an understanding of one. How do how do you become? First off, how in the heck do you guys become Hall of Famers in a field where there was no Hall of Fame when you started? many years ago. So let's just, Dave, tell us about yeah. how you got started and maybe give us an idea later on, like when you turned the corner and said, Oh my God, I can actually do this. Um, I, I was a little, I was a little late in life when I thought I could do it. When I started engineering, I was about 35. I, I never had a plan to be an engineer. Even while I was engineering, it was more just something I was, I really enjoyed doing. And I come from a musical family, so I've always been either playing an instrument or, or doing something in the musical world. But I never thought that, 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 that engineering would appeal to me. And when I had an opportunity to work in the studio, it, it just kind of took me over. And, and, I, and um, I, I, I really fell in love with it to the point where I kind of, I kind of put the, uh, the music side on hold. Although I try to mix like a musician and a producer rather than an engineer. but uh, it, it was it, it was a somewhat chance meeting with some people that, that that got me into the into the engineering profession. I never thought I could do it, and, and I have days where I still think I can't. But that's, that's the way it went for me. Well, the chance thing, though, those chance things matter. Tell us a little bit about like that chance, like that happenstance that um, unlocks your future. Well, I had a band together. I had a bunch of bands, and this particular band had uh, a Leonard Skinner <laughs> member in it, an original member. We were we were kind of coming to an end of a of a, of, of the band's existence. It, it was it was a great band, and uh, everybody in it was was high quality musicians. And uh, the guitar player and I um, were, were were thinking about what the next step was. Uh, just out of the blue, I can't remember which one of us said it, but one of us said, "Man, we should build a studio." And I'm like, "I don't know how to build a studio," you know. And, yeah. And Larry, Larry said the same thing. And then through that process, we met a really successful, uh, at that time, uh, artist named Paul Davis, who was who had three or four number one records. And then I met Ed C. And I met a couple of other guys, uh, Phil Benton. And they saw something in me I didn't see in myself and um, kind of kind of gave me an opportunity to, to fail and to suck and to be bad and sound horrible and to have, have clients fire me. But I made it through all of that with the help and, and, and um, of a lot of people, and that, that's how I'm here. Hey, Herb, what did those guys see in yeah. Dave? I mean, it's one thing to say, yeah, they gave me a shot, and I swept up, and I kept getting better, but you saw something in him. What did those guys see in Dave way back then? I don't know. I wasn't around. Um, <laughs> I know what I saw. Well, no, it's true. I mean, Dave and I hooked up when Dave – came to LA, my career started, we both come from musical families, um, but I was a singer um, and won some awards for singing and then had a broadcast degree. Um, I tend to try to run my life in an intentional way. And I came to LA with intentions and I ended up at, you know, record companies with intentions. And David Geffen was my 
North Star, along with Barry Gordy and a few others. And I kind of moved my way to the executive thing. And a marketing and promotion person, I just was very drawn to A&R and the left, right, <clears throat> left brain, right brain process. And as I made my move into A&R around LA and Babyface and people like that, uh, Dave and I ended up in Skip Sailor's studio in his lobby. And we had about two hour conversation and Dave wasn't yet established in LA. And about a month later, I got a call from a A&R guy at Island and they had this project and it was a hip hop project, but it needed a different perspective. And I said, I met this cool guy who comes from Atlanta and you should give him a try. And Dave got the job, killed the mix, turned it into a hit and his LA career had taken off. So what I saw is what I continue to see today, which is Dave has a capacity to take any genre of music and make it really radio friendly and commercial without sacrificing any of the genre's truth. And that's a very specific tool. Um, not very many people can do it. So when you can do an EDM record or a hip hop record or a country record or bounce music or whatever the case may be and make it authentic to the artist, authentic to the guy on the laptop and the earphones, but also good for Kiss FM, <clears throat> that's a gift that comes from over time. And, and we got close because I started managing Ben and he mixed all the records that I was managing at the time that became a hit. And then 25 years later, after we were had been friends, this opportunity for Consolos Place came up and created it, and off we went. And off we went. Let me add something to that, Pete. Sure. Uh, when I met Herb, he had never heard anything I'd ever done. He took me over to uh, Island Records and introduced me as, as the person who was going to mix an artist that he was working with. It was a pretty cool project. And to this day, I... I asked myself the question that you've asked Herb, what did he see in me? Because I had my Bon Jovi boots, I had waist length hair, I had my skinny jeans tucked into my Bon Jovi boots. I was not I was not presenting a picture of someone that, that, that exuded I don't know, you know, and so um I I wouldn't have a career without Herb and um whatever he saw in me uh, gave me the confidence to move on ahead because I, I wasn't a great engineer when I got here. I wasn't even very good, but I had good taste and I had, you know, I, I, I had a love for it. So I don't know that passion is really that important in, 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 in a career, but it was just something I had to do. And, and, and Dave was, Dave was a lot better than he thought he was. And I think some of the answer that Dave to the question that Dave posed at least as a specific to me, part of the guys that I emulated and liked, they were all talent guys. David Geffen was a talent guy and a business guy. Barry Gordy was a talent guy and a business guy. And I've always wanted to be that. Fortunately, it turned out that way in my career beyond managing Dave in lots of different ways. And there was something in the conversation that I had with Dave, there was something in the records that he had done and so on and so forth that happened to fit what this a and person was calling for. And the idea that that early in my career, a label would say, well, we trust your instincts, just make a referral. You, you take a shot and you have to trust your gut. And that mm -hmm. trusting of your gut is something that is part of the success of Consolos Place because we like to find out how people's gut works. What makes the <laughs> producer of Lizzo think mm -hmm. about what they think about what makes Joe Barisi deal with tool and the way he deals with tool. So Dave was better than he thought. He walked in and absolutely killed it. And his career never, his career took off and never looked back from there. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Hey, Herb, when, when you were first given that trust as an A&R guy, I mean, that, that, that is a big deal. Like you are, you are the musical nose of that organization what, at what point in your career are you? How old are you when, when you get that license to go out and make these calls? That's a really interesting question. So I never officially had the title of an A&R person. I just kind of, I was fascinated at being in the studio back when the studio was church and back when not everybody was invited in. You know, you had to have a certain etiquette to be invited into a studio and to stay, to be around people who were, you know, 
dealing with their art form, sometimes dealing with, you know, substances that they didn't want you to know they were dealing with. And it was a very special fraternity to be part of it. There's something to that gate being buzzed in in the back and you only know the entrance and then you go in this room and magic's being created. And I think really what happened is I went past having to be an A&R person to being a manager. Mm. And then as a manager, I could deal with the creativity of my artists and other kinds of things. There's all kinds of different managers, but I was one who absolutely dealt with creativity and, and, and stuff like that. Creativity, not just about music, but about putting on shows and all kinds of stuff. So it was somewhere in the transition out of being a marketing person, which has been very helpful in my career, to being a creative person and then what's weird is once you hit it once or twice, then people trust you. So I, I had a, probably 10 years where I was consultant for five or six different labels to help find talent. And then that turned into being a consultant to find executive talent, which I like just as much as finding musical talent. Um, and frankly, it always was a kick in the pants that, you know, I, when we give talks, I tell people all the time, it's a incredible privilege for people to allow you to become a pop steward yeah the fact that people will trust you trust your taste and i take that shit deadly seriously because it's important i'm not frivolous about it and um i see it as as great privilege and and frankly the people who get to do it and do it successfully you know there's not that many in the pop world's a big world so it's been a fantastic part of my career, and it's, it's one of the things I've enjoyed the most. Can we talk a little bit about your time with Solar Records? Because on the show, we've had a lot of people that you surely have been in the same room with, um, the, you know, the drummer from Shalimar and all, you know, a lot of different people. Talk a little bit about that time yeah. and what you picked up from all of those acts. Well, let, let me, it's a great question. Let me slightly turn it. Please. Solar Records was led by one of the all-time entrepreneurial minds in the music business. He will never get his just due. So we didn't work at a, at a record company. We worked at a black entrepreneurial think tank. And so Dick Griffey in his day, who started as a male nurse, then created a record label with Don Cornelius called Solar Records, which is the sound of Los Angeles records. We managed a presidential campaign we put together, we appeared at the UN to fight apartheid. We created a stock so that people could buy and get actually a record by Jesse Jackson so that they could invest and see their money grow. We had the first ever building that was part of a production deal that was built in Hollywood before it gentrified and is now the building that Diane Warren owns and where her office is. I'm in the picture breaking ground. We unionized black promoters. We had a movie company 25 years ago, which was unheard of. Uh, we took the Jacksons out on tour. We were asked to think way outside the record box. And they picked entrepreneurial types who've now gone on to different successes. LA, Babyface, Jimmy and Terry did their first records. The Chronic and Dr. Dre came there first before they went to whatever Dick Griffey put an SSL in his building when it was unheard of and brought it over from England and went through all this stuff. So it was a place where we were forced to think outside the box and also put out great music. So Shalimar, Jeffrey Daniels taught Michael Jackson the moonwalk, which is chronicled in a book. Midnight Star used karate's and flutes and all kinds of stuff to put on a live performance that was incredible. You know, so these bands broke ground lakeside and the way it, they did their funk thing and nautical uniforms and stuff. People hadn't seen that. And so we were just thriving in this environment that said, think outside the box, think outside the box, find the way. And the other thing that he did was he gave us real fiscal responsibility. Here are budgets. We were distributed by different people. We managed those budgets. And so... A lot of us went from that and used that as a springboard to go out and have entrepreneurial careers. And it was really an amazing way for a guy who was a male nurse and had a vision to find other people who had vision and then push them to think very, very differently. And so when the executives get together, 
and we think about those ideas, it's, it's to us, it's amazing how groundbreaking it was. This is, you know, late eighties, early nineties. Nobody, nobody thought about that stuff. So that's what solar was for me. And a lot of the artists, like the Whispers, for instance, they still are my business model of one of the smartest acts I've ever been around. They own their publishing a long time. They own their masters. They're 50 years of touring. They had their whole band on pension plans early. You know, these, were, these were unheard of for all of the acts. So it was a place, if you've got a brain like mine, and I'm saying I have a good brain. It's just a needy <laughs> brain. Right. That could really, great, great could really thrive. Like that, that was a place that was stimulative. And I think completely shaped a lot of us to go out and continue to try to break ground and do entrepreneurial things. When you said think outside the box, get outside the box, you talked about a lot of examples, but but you're picking up tools where you're like you're like there's no fear in this area. There's not, actually not a wall here. What are some of the things that you yeah. did pull out? Like things that you continue to use even when the, you were inside of a box be like, "Ah, what are some of those tools and lessons that you learned specifically by by Dick Ritchie's guidance?" Well, live presentation Okay. You know, able to put on something like the Pensado Awards for four or five years with no discernible background and have it absolutely rock and be successful. Uh, the creation of Pensado's Place, you know, we were first, we were market makers. An idea I had because of a medical incident with a dear friend. And people thought we were crazy, but we, we stuck the landing. The, the, the way we brand and where we put um, our emphasis versus now some of our competition. We are very big on production. We're very big on having quality guests. Brand building that sustains over time. As I tell people all the time, it's easy to get hot. It's hard to sustain being hot. And we're starting our 11th year. You know, how to speak, how to be concise in terms of reaching out to the marketplace. So being super detail oriented, small, small details count. Most people blow past them and think they don't. And then they wonder why stuff doesn't work. Yeah. Things like that, exposition. And, and then also an attention to business affairs and how it supports creativity, how to be around creative people, how to get the best out of creative people, how to get creative people to trust you, stuff like that. Yeah. You see Dave in a lobby and you, you know, you're know you working with bands like Shalimar and Collage and all these other bands and you see a guy that looks like a roadie for, for Bon Jovi. What, you know, you'd have a conversation in a lobby, but how did you know? Well, keep in mind, he wasn't looking at, you know, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio either. So uh -huh. <laughs> we, we, both, we both had to eye each other. He was, I was eyeing his mullet. He was eyeing my afro. And uh, I didn't have a but I didn't have a moment. I, I didn't have a moment. Well, well let's I not. Have, it was a modified have, mullet. We'll, we'll call it a I, California mullet. I had, to, I had an extended DA hairdo. A DA. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. I, you absolutely did. He it, it was. He was Mad Men before Mad Men. <laughs> the, the thing that, unless you are deaf or dumb, that you have to be attracted to is just days intelligence. And so I, I think we kind of match in terms of curiosity and quest and knowing what we're talking about in our particular areas. And so we just had, a, we didn't sit down and have a conversation about audio or music or any of that kind of stuff. We just talked. And so I would have been his friend if we had done no business because he's just a smart dude who I like a lot. It was later on that I found out how big his heart was. And so then, then you know, it's, that's game, set, match for me. So, but also the way he talked about his craft and the kind of people, you know, when you, you talk about somebody that whatever the haircut was, DA, mullet, whatever it was, but he had worked with Cameo and had worked with James Brown and all these kinds of things in Atlanta, you go, this cat's got something different. And it, it turned out in serendipity or Jesus or luck or whatever you put your tips on. The, the reality of it is, is the call for the project, which was not my project, was actually Belle Bib DeVoe, was a perfect match. The song, the remix that needed to be done, the producers who were two white guys, there was a perfect match for Dave to go into. It could have been something else that might not have gone as well. And once mm -hmm. it went, it was so kind of 
radio earth shattering, like, oh man, this is like a hip hop record with rock elements in it and rock drums and they're killing it. And so everybody paid attention. And you know, in this business, when you do something hot, then everybody wants to do it. Yeah. So at that point in time, it was then just steering the ship. So they kept doing hot projects. And But it was all his gift, you know, my connect, lucky match and but if they didn't did the work didn't do the work it wouldn't matter so so that's what i saw it was you know easy to see the intelligence easy to imagine the craftsmanship and then it turned out right which by the way also made me look good yeah that helps right no 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 we are defined by success we're not defined by intelligence so there's a lot of people who are not right. as smart but have hit records they're making millions of dollars so it's important that you have some success with whatever you do. Otherwise you're just the smart person who just, who can't, you know, can't win anything. So yeah, it definitely helps when your clients are hot. Dave, you you get all these compliments, like, you know how to do it. So we had, we had Timmy Kelly on the show a while back, right? Him and his buddy get in the car and they drive South on threadbare tires. It's a one way trip. Either they're going to make it or not. They were burning their ships while they were sailing to the place. Right. And then, you know, they get the opportunity to get in the studio and they just flat out won't leave. Like they'll stay in there for 40 hours straight until they're confident that what they've done is something special, you know, and that was sort of their model. Um, Does that resonate with you or do you do something different? You know, the hard work, you know, outworking your problems, that's, that's required. And then you need to catch a couple of breaks and then layer in a little bit of genius and you have a chance at it. But give me an idea. What is it that you do? that enables you to, you know, win Grammys, to, to get gold records, that kind of thing? I'm probably the wrong person to ask, but I'll, I'll try. My philosophy is a little bit different and has been known to just drive my friends up the wall sometimes, but I've always enjoyed the journey more than the destination. And so I got good, not because I was trying to get good, but I was having so much fun along the way and, and the learning was fun. The people were fun and the process was fun. For me, I I don't know how to describe it because there's a lot of of, of frustration involved in in my pathway. There's a lot of crying, a lot of putting my fist through the wall and yelling into a pillow. That was was pretty minor. Mostly my approach was just, I just like being around, I, I, I like being around smart people. Uh, I gravitated to Herb Im- immediately. I like being around people that, that like me, you know? And so if I put myself where I'm always wanted and needed or liked, uh, I'm I'm real happy and, and, uh, and I do better work. But as far as like, like a plan or a goal, I, I never really, never really thought that through quite as good as I should have. But along the way, like I said, I, I'm the product of so many people's help and so many people's belief in me that it's hard for me to take credit for much of anything in my life. Uh, there's been, there's been several people, including Herb at the top where had I not bet them, I, I, I'd probably be asking, do you want fries with that? <laughs> so it's, it's hard to answer, but, but the world that I came along in is a little different than the world today. So, so I think that uh, my daughter does have goals. My daughter does have ambitions and she does have a plan. And she's doing pretty well with that. So, it, it, I'm I'm a, I'm a I'm a product of my time, and you know, a little bit hippie, a little bit overschooled, a little bit of a of, of a of a kind of a, a wandering lost soul, you know, that kind of thing. And all that together is 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 me. I don't know if any of that makes any sense, but uh, but I don't know. Well, I, I think it does. Okay. I, I I think it does because. To get where you're from, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to be an original. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at your, your, everybody should go to your Wikipedia page and just look at your discography. And it's ridiculous. You've been doing 10 projects a year for, you know, 15 to 20 years, well, yeah. you know, like you just really been going at it. I don't know who put that together, but it's only got about 15% of what I've done. But anyway, I, 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 I don't know how <laughs> I didn't put that together. I've always felt like the most important thing in life is to commit. Uh, nothing can start. No processes can start. The road can't unfold in front of you until you commit. Once you commit, then life becomes interesting because it's rare that you end up where you thought you were going to go. And, and sometimes you take a right-hand turn. Sometimes you take a 180. 
my first attempts to, to, to start in the business were, were most people would, would call a failure. I actually went to London to try and start my career there. It didn't work out. Came back to Atlanta and came to California. That worked out. So I'm still here. And that's kind of the way I've done things. I, I don't recommend it to anyone. Uh, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. but along the way, you know, I mean, along the way, it, it had its benefits, and it had it. It was it was it was a struggle sometimes, but when you, when you can kind of see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, uh, which is a, which is a metaphor I hate, but anyway, it keeps you going. And then sometimes you owe responsibility to the people that have tried to help you, and so the people that try to help you, you can't let them down. And then that keeps me going a lot too, you know? Yeah. yeah. I want to back up a little bit and talk a little bit about your path and, and your, your sort of a, I don't want to call it aimless because, you know, we have, you know, guys like us that do this kind of thing. You have sort of a sense of things, but what would you tell yourself 25, 30 years ago when, when this journey is beginning and and then would yourself back then listen to it? Like if you did the Bill and Ted thing, be like, Hey Ted, I'm you from the future. Don't worry, it's going to be crazy, but you're going to be a Hall of Famer at the end. You know what do you what do you tell that guy, and would he even be able to hear it at all? Well, I don't know if I can answer that. What what you're asking me is is, is uh, if I were if I went back in time and and told twenty uh, five year old me some advice, what would I say? Yeah, yeah, and, and then would twenty five year year old you believe you? Well, I'm kind of gullible. Yeah, I, I trust everybody. Uh, <laughs> and, and by the way. <laughs> I don't, I don't advise that either. You know, you have to have a tolerance for getting screwed over, but also the benefit is sometimes you get the benefit of, 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 of finding a person that's actually a really good person. You know, I probably, I probably wouldn't have believed, I probably wouldn't have believed current me because in order for me to, to become a, um, an engineer, I had to disappoint my mom who was a guitar player and she wanted me to be a guitar player. And, there was never really a whole lot of leeway about what I was going to be other than a guitar player. And then my dad was a scientist and there wasn't any leeway there either. I had to be a scientist. So there was a pathway in front of me and I, I was not obligated to take it by my parents. It was more of a suggestion. I think for me, I love, I love anything musical. I love anything. Uh, well, I don't love anything musical, but, but, but music gives me, gives me pleasure and a reason to exist. But so does science. I love science. So I like the I like the spiritual side of music, and I like the predictable side of science. So uh, I would probably tell him, "Dude, keep trying. One day it could work." You know. <laughs> <laughs> Herb, same basic question for you. When you look back and you tell yourself twenty five, thirty years ago, what would you tell yourself, and would that self believe you? Uh, great question. I think I would tell my younger self that your older predecessor was a damn fool and made some stupid ass decisions. <laughs> so don't do it. <laughs> you know, ooh. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. <laughs> so don't do it. <laughs> you know, I think that the the thing that I like about my career, and there are things that I don't like, is that it didn't go far from the way I envisioned it as a young person. I, I come from a background where my parent particularly my father, broke ground in a certain space, in the sports space. And I got a text from a friend of mine, an attorney friend of mine, and we got this award. And he said, you know, it, it, what you probably haven't thought about is that in your family, you've had two people who've broken ground in an area that had not been broken. And I never looked at it that way. But because I think of my father's path, I've been a dreamer from the time I was four or five. Uh, I know that at eight or nine, I wanted to be, my major career would be the business of Herb Trowick. I knew that before I was 10 years old. How I would get there, who knew? So in some ways, emulating the people that I like and the way they did their careers and so on and so forth and 
you know, resulting in a Hall of Fame and had some success. Um, the general macro approach has worked. There are micro decisions along the way that I wouldn't think I'd advise anybody not to go to. There's no trajectory that's straight up. And mm -hmm. in our talks, you know, I always talk about how much you learn from failure. Yes. Failure prepares you for success, right? Yes. And so ultimately, I think if I hadn't gone through those hard knocks, and I went through hard knocks in my management career. Prince Albert's place hasn't always been straight up. It's been, it's been pretty much ascendant. But, you know, we've had to hustle. You know, we're a small team. We have no sales team. We run an expensive business. Um, and it's been a grind making sure people, you know, get their checks and do what they need to do. There's been tremendous sacrifice. I think you have to go through adversity to get better. I don't know anybody who just had the golden path up. So I'd probably tell the young guy, if you, if you hit, life is like surfing. Okay. And basically what you want to do is you want to stay on the board. You don't have to look good. You don't have to ride the lip of the wave and hit the curl, but you just have to stay up on the board. Yeah. And eventually the waves will flatten out and you'll be okay. And that you'll be better when you go through that. Uh, that would be one thing. The other thing would be, be curious as shit. Never stop being curious. Never stop dreaming. Set, set the bar high. Set your own bar high. And I likely would have listened to that. I might not have taken the same prescribed path, but those kind of macro things when I, you know, if you were in my living room, it's full of books and it's books about people that I emulate and self-made men and women. And to a person, to a man or a woman, the fearlessness of setting your own path and, and risking is, is part and parcel of their stories. That fearlessness, you have to, you have to, like you said, you have to have your face kicked in by life. Yeah. And just to understand that you can take it and that the things that make you afraid are probably the things that you got to lean into, you know, and obviously yeah. make some mistakes overdoing that as well, because that's part of life. But you're right, man, that. That fearlessness is a teacher. And then I like to talk about my life bonsai tree. And by the end, there will be no branches on it. Just this ugly stick that doesn't make any sense, but it'll be perfect. Yep. You know, does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yep. Yeah. No, I mean, to your point, I, I used to look exactly like Denzel Washington, but my face got kicked in so much. I ended up <laughs> now looking like, looking, like, looking like a troll. So, uh but no, your point is your point is correct, and I think, interestingly enough, because Dave Dave alluded to this, when we came up, there was a structure, and there was certain paths that got you through. They were very hard to get through. There were a lot of gatekeepers. Talent, in my opinion, was way more special and unique to you breaking through. There weren't the tools that allowed it, you know, music to become commoditized and everybody can make music and everybody can put it out and everybody can put it up on something. Before, it was a narrow fraternity and a special path. And you really had to get your shit tight to get through there, let alone get work, let alone yes. be good at work, let alone become special. That's a huge difference. And the kids don't like to hear that. And that's okay. And I think they have interesting tools and I support that. But a lot of these folks would not get through back then. So the fact that we got through, when we got the call for the Hall of Fame, I was very specific. It was a group of my friends from NAM, And, you know, I was kind of speechless, which is rare for me. And I asked them specifically, is this just for Consalos Place or is it for the whole career? They said for the whole career. So when you sit back and you take a look at what I call BPP and APP, before Consalos Place and after Consalos Place, um, the fact that we sustained this long over time at a high level, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Hell yeah. I want to ask you guys too, because, and I really, ultimately, I want to have John, my, my co-host, co-founder of the show, come back and talk about Pensado's place, because that's really his sweet spot. He, and he's at Hamilton tonight, so he can't do this with me. And hopefully we'll get a chance to chat when you guys are at NAM. But you guys are in the Hall of Fame. You're in there for your careers and I just wonder, like, when you look back at, at your multi-decades of experience, even from being kids, you know, going way, way back, 
what are those moments that stand out where you're like, that helped me get That was a big fucking brick right there in the Hall of Fame resume. That record, that edit, that EQ setting. What are some of those things for me? And I guess I'll ask Dave first. What are some of those things that you're like, yes, these are things that made my work special and worthy of, look, I mean, dude. It's the Hall of Fame, you know? Like, it doesn't matter what Hall of Fame it is. It's your Hall of Fame for your field, and holy shit, here you guys are. So what are some of those moments or those achievements or those artistic choices that really cemented your resume as you look back on it? And just if you would start, Dave, and then Herb, when he's done, if you'll go. For me, uh, I've had a, I've had a, uh, I've had a lot of highlights. I, I'll, try, I'll try and isolate a few. When I was about uh, eight or nine years old, I heard a, um, I don't even remember how old I was, but I heard a Jimmy Reed record, uh, Bright Lights, Big City and Big Boss Man. That's when I received a little bit of clarity about where my life was going to go. I had no, uh, uh, I didn't know if it was going to be as a performer or as a guitar player. I certainly didn't think it was going to be an engineer. Uh, a, a, a person named uh, Larry Turner, who, who I had several bands with and uh uh, excellent guitar player, musician. He gave me the courage to try the engineering thing. So that was a big moment. I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I, I, I now realize it. And then running into Paul Davis, I, I, I had the luxury of learning a lot about mixing from a from a a, a multi 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 platinum uh, songwriter. And then I ran into a guy named Ed C, who who had no reason to help me, and he really helped me a lot. And sometimes help can be just a certification that, that you're good. And so I would play my mixes and my, my, at that time I was doing everything, writing and co-writing with my friend, John Wunderlich, uh, W-U-N-D-E-R-L-I-C-H. And we, we, we did a lot of great records together. We had a couple of regional hits. Mostly, mostly it was, it was, I, I can, I can shorten this by saying that m- most of the big things that happened in my life were a function of, of someone who who, who kind of showed me showed me uh, kind of like shined a flashlight in my path and, and kind of gave me a little clarity on 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 the way I was going and, and and to encourage me to keep going that way. So obviously my parents were important, but in L.A. it, it, it was definitely Herb. There's a there's a gentleman who's passed and and um, I miss him every day. Uh, his name was Lil Silas and Lil started out as a DJ. Herb knows him better than I do, but Lul, uh, like they say, took a liking to me and made me the engineer I was. He, he, he was tough on me, but yet it had a purpose. And then Ron Fair, the, the chairman of Geffen, chairman of A&M, I was his guy and he was my guy for 25 years and we still work together. So, so all my big moments were the function of someone who took the time to, to, to reach out and give me a hand. And then those times tend to come when you when when you don't expect them. You know, when when you're trying to succeed, it's hard to succeed. But when when you let when you let success come to you, it, it's just a little bit easier. But my struggles were mostly, and my big moments were mostly just people taking the time to tell me I was good at something. That's great. What about you, Herb? What do you, what stands out as you look back? I think early on in church, realizing. The power of music, because my mother made me sing and play piano and do stuff. Probably as I matured, realizing that music had a wonderful and interesting impact on women. And it was good to develop taste and see what people like. And that made my search and hunger for music um, grow even more. So there was just a love with going to a record store and reading the back of an album and finding stuff, which informed me about kind of where I wanted to go career wise. I think when I got out here, clearly being able to work at Solar unlocked what I thought was there. Then when I stepped out and became a manager, my time with Brian McKnight and that success, which ran for about 13 or 14 years and was an incredible talent, but an, an incredibly complicated project, uh, but kind of put my management chops on the on the table, and we were able to bridge the gap. I was able to really influence the direction of the projects and the marketing and the single choices and so on and so forth, and 
you know, you take a crooner when hip hop is exploding and try to find a place for him. That was a, that was an interesting challenge. Clearly my time with Maurice White was life-changing. He told me some things about myself that were um, things I only dreamt of and hoped for, but he confirmed them. And I sometimes would just sit in awe and go, did Maurice White tell you you're an impresario? <laughs> yeah. And, and and he did. And it would be, I remember we were coming home from New York. I took a, I took his catalog to Broadway and we were listening to music in the back of a car and, you know, musicians listen differently. And he, as I was getting ready to get out, he said, you know, man, you listen like a musician. That's why I like talking to you. And I was like, mic drop, end of story. I don't care what anybody says to me from this point. Um, so my time with him was really amazing and confirmed some stuff. And then, you know, literally Pensado's place is equal to all those moments. Um, yeah. It shouldn't have worked. We were not broadcasters. The idea was solid. The kind of the two of us coming together brought different perspectives on something. And, you know, when you're two, three weeks in and somebody sends you a picture from Taipei of a yes. bunch of Chinese kids gathered yes. around your screen. And we were like, Oh shit. So now we're, again, we're about to pass 500 episodes. And what Dave and I do in the team is we listen to our guests to find out how is the show still relevant. And the amazing people that come on our show, the talent level that's so high and the, yeah. the gracious things they say about how important the show is to them. It is the OG of shows. It is the place they go to. It's a bucket list item for them. It's just that and the other. We, we still are stunned at how much the show is important to people. And it's, you know, so those were, those are probably the highlight points. There's a lot of, other, you know, your first time met with Quincy Jones amazing the first time you know you take a trip overseas um yeah the first time you get out of trouble there's there's all kinds of other stuff that could go on but those are some of the highlights i appreciate it i mean that, that's such a great lay down and you know it's not one moment like you said before earlier like it, it's you have to always i always talk about we have a lot of musical conversations on the show and we talk yeah. about like the brilliance of a young band that writes these incredible songs, but no songwriter stops being good at 25. You know, they get better and better and better. It's just hard to stay on top of the entire market, but bands like the Rolling Stones that do it, you know, earth, wind and fire can still go out and put music out. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's earth, wind and fire. We're crying out loud. You know, even, even as the band yeah. changes and evolves, it, they're just so great at that. That's that's what true greatness is, is adapting to era. You know, um, I like to say like someone like Omar Hakim is the greatest drummer of all time because any song, any band, any era, any time, he'll play it and knock the groove down. You know, and it's it's you can say John Bonham, and I won't argue with it too much, but Omar has continued to do it, you know, over and over again. He teaches well, Yeah, Omar's a beast. And to your point, I was just gonna say, I, I I'm agreeing with you that most of the times in these kind of retrospectives of your career and so on and so forth, you don't talk about the bad stuff. I learned when I had to bankrupt my company. Uh, I learned when traveling with Maurice and he was dealing with Parkinson's. Um, I learned when I got fired by some talent. You know, that stuff are highlights too, but they're not highlights at the moment. Yeah. There are yeah. things that later on you look back and go, oh man, if that didn't happen, this wouldn't have happened. And I learned and I handled the next situation better because of that. And one of the things about Pensala's place, and I, I'm particularly kind of a stickler about, is, is we need to be honest and get honesty out of people. When a kid is in some, you know, third world country and they hear Pooh Bear or somebody say, oh, no, I, you know, I, I deal with this particular problem. They go, oh, my God, I'm like them. I'm not alone. Okay, so being frail or having anxiety, whatever the whatever the issue is, and I just think those conversations don't happen enough. There's too much kind of rah rah, yeah, celebratory stuff. And why not why not tell the whole story? That that's what makes the whole person. 
There's a couple of things that I've picked up along the way from doing our show. Like you guys, we've been around for a while, not quite as long, but we're at 640 episodes right now. And you just, you are a fool if you do it this long and don't pick up some wisdom. And I actually got some wisdom secondhand from Maurice myself. We had on Allie Willis, Rest Your Soul. And she said that, well, I think it was Boogie Wonderland. And I think it's the part, and I don't remember this for sure, but I'm just going to go with this. You know, and he's just doing, ah, ah, ah. She's like, yeah, but I have words for that. And he's like, Allie, you never let words get in the way of the groove. It's the, and I'm like, okay. oh my God, like that's such a, you know, you want there to be words there because they're supposed to be until the, the real, like the genius comes in and says, no. And it's an obvious thing that you never realized and never maybe would have until someone else opens your eyes. If you can collect moments right. like that, you know? To be specific, it, it was when they go, body she wanted that lyrics there. And he said, nope. Yes. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. And it's such a great story. Um, you know, David Mamet, you know? Show up on time, know your lines, and hit your mark, whatever. Like, super simple, you know, just – and and the last one was, like, you know, be the truth. Like, be what you are, you know, not just tell the truth, but, like, be your truth and, and who you are in that moment. So th- these are those things, those lessons. I, we got just a, a one big question left, and, and I'll let you guys answer it in turn. And I'll, I'll, this time I'll reverse the order, and Herb, have you do it. But, Herb, when you look at Dave and what he's accomplished yeah. – you did your you do you do your things. What are the one or two things that he has done that make him a Hall of Famer? When you look at your friend, I mean, no, every one of these stories that last this long, it's a love story. You guys clearly love each other and are passionate about your work. And all you got to do is watch Pensado's place for a few minutes to get that. When you look at your friend Dave, why is he a Hall of Famer? Well, when you see the show, the reason that there's so much love there is we have sex right before the show each week. It's just once a week. <laughs> um, There's a great secret. Um, no, here's the thing. I think that the consistent kernel of Dave is his heart. And it's his willingness to share and be in, embracing. Now, when you're representing you sometimes have to get in the way of that and cut it off and stop people from taking advantage of it. But you also have to understand that you can't change changing that about him would change who he is. Mm. And sometimes it's not always been to his benefit, but it has absolutely benefited his legacy. And it is ultimately who he is as a human, who he is as a mixer, who he is as a father, who he is as a friend. And it, it's really special because in a business where you have success, it's, it's hard not to become jaded and you know, sort of cynical about the process. So it takes a lot to be open. That, that's, that's the guy that I know. Um, and that's the consistent trade over the 25 plus years, almost 30 years that we've known each other. And then Dave, same question for you about Herb. Well, wow, it's it's, uh, it's an easy it's an easy thing to imagine. It's hard to kind of to put it in words that have that, that can carry. Uh, the words are words are letting me down in terms of. I'll start here. The first year that Herb and I uh, were 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 an entity together, where he was managing me, <clears throat> he he didn't he didn't take a commission because I I had another manager at the time, and it was a bad mistake. It wasn't a bad mistake. It just didn't work out, and it wasn't it would never work out. And and he worked just as hard for me as if I was his top client, which I wasn't. And I'll, I'll never forget that. And then Herb Herb is Herb's his his intellect and his intelligence uh, have always been inspirational to me in, in, in the sense that almost in a snobbish way, I, I, I like intelligent people and when when herb says something it, it comes from a position where where I, I don't doubt it sometimes i don't do it but it's not because i i, I don't i don't agree with it it's, it's just part of being me and this is a good time for me to apologize to all the, all the, all the <laughs> grief i've given herb I'm not laughing at it because i'm not proud of it but there's something about herb that when when herb's in your life in, in any capacity, it gives you the confidence to go out and do things that you might not have other done. So 
the strength that he possesses, I kind of usurp that and, 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 and into my mindset, and, and it gives me a fearlessness, you know. There's a, there's multiple things that, that, that Herb has taught me, and, 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 and I remember and utilize them all. Like something as simple as, you teach people how to treat you, and and if you not if you're not happy with the way you're being treated, just it's your fault. It's not anybody else's fault. Just 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 teach them how you want to be treated. Uh, and then his his attention to detail, uh, I get a little I get a little away from that concept sometimes. Well, most of the time, I admire that. I admire his tenacity. When Herb when Herb latches onto something, he's he's a pit bull. He, he doesn't turn loose. Even sometimes it's affected his health and it's affected his well-being. Some situations that that, that he's been in. There's there's a, a love that Herb can give you that that can be a little bit expensive to get, but once you get it, you've got it forever. And by expensive, I mean he doesn't just randomly let people into his life at a, at a close level. I've observed him for years, and I've only seen that happen three or four times, and so. It's a small club, and I'm proud to be of it. And it does have a responsibility, but I feel I feel like I I never had to mature. And from the time we started the show, I think I've matured a little bit, and, and I'm real happy with that. I, I've had a little structure in my life. I, I um, and, and I'm real happy that I have that structure. So it's just I I don't know what I would do if I didn't have Herb as my friend. You know, it's. Um, that's, it's, it's, that's enough uh, Herb Trawler talk for the next 10 years. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how I can handle hearing it's hard to, it's you know, just glowing terms. A part I'm, I'm used to hearing Herb Trawler asshole and jerk. <laughs> 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 this, is, this is unusual for me. Thank you very much. But I, I don't know if I can handle it. It's kind of like having a sugar high. <laughs> but, well, you know, sometimes... Uh, as humans, we take friendship for granted. Sometimes, sometimes we take for granted the fact that we're going to always have our friends here. And 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 you know, it's life is a, a, an ephemeral thing. And and uh, I think sometimes it is good to to let people know how you really feel. And 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 this this gave us an opportunity to do that. And Pete, let me just say this: what you're hearing is what I'm talking about. Dave is always gracious about this. He's always giving support. He's he's, he's never. He's unbridled about making sure you know how much somebody else has been impactful for him and has been that way for the 30 years I've known him. So you, you just got a good a good dose of the graciousness of who he is and how big his heart is. Yeah, well, and, and when you try to run a business, you want more of that around than, you know, folks who are – look, sometimes you've got to work with someone who's obstinate, but but I want more – I want more Daves. I want more Herbs, people that are there. You know, I, I'm a combat guy. And, and let me back up and say this. Dave, you're 100% right. You have to every now and then slow down and say, man, I love the hell out of who you are, how you do it. Even when we disagree, I, I just, I love the hell out of you. Because if you don't, you're right. It, it'll be too late. And then you'll be saying it when they're dead. And we all need to hear these things when we're alive. So from from all of us out here in humanity, I'm speaking for everybody in the whole world now, 7 billion of us. Thank you guys for what you've done, for what you've created, when you've pushed hard, when you've taken the ass chewings from each other and the hard looks to get through a project. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because without those moments, we don't get these incredible things. I mean, you know, all of the artists are out there, you know, in part because of what you guys have created and and Pensado's place. I mean, gosh, we got to come back and fully talk about that with John because it's such a fantastic way to learn about music. And, you know, I, I, I'm not even going to be able to do it justice. But just, again, yes, slow down, thank each other because you just don't know when it's too late. And, and while we were talking, by the way, Wes Maybe, who's an engineer slash producer in London, is traveling this way. And, and you know, this guy knows his stuff. He produced uh, the, the most recent UB40 album and, and mixed it. And he said, hey, nice. when you're talking to those guys, tell them I want to be on the show. Like, that's how ubiquitous <laughs> you guys are in your industry. So when I say Pensado's Place needs its own show, like, that's that's why. Because someone with her, Wes's stature, you know, he, he's like, oh, my God, it is a bucket list item, you guys. You've built something special. And I just, I am thrilled to be able to take an extra moment and let the world know that you're out there, that you've created this stuff and made all of our lives better. So for me and everybody else, thank you. 
<laughs> well, we appreciate it, Pete. Great interview, great questions. Congratulations yeah. on your longevity. And anytime you want to reload on St. Carlos Place, just let us know, and we'll be happy to help you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, I, I just ran out of Kleenex, so it's time to go. <laughs>